Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming today on a beautiful summer afternoon, coming in and listening to this. This is Steenbach Lectures in Biochemistry. For some of you in the audience, I want to say a few comments about Professor Steenbach and his impact in the world. So he was a distinguished professor of biochemistry in the early to mid-1900s, and his most distinguishing academic achievement was the identification of how pro form of vitamin D was converted into the active form of vitamin D by UV irradiation. The impact of that discovery was that childhood rickets was essentially eliminated worldwide. This was a debilitating, terrible disease of childhood, and that identification of that vitamin, how to make it active, was transformative for people all over the world. Now, Professor Steenbach was also important here at UW-Madison because he was instrumental in establishing the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. WARF, many of you here part of campus have heard of WARF. That is a world-leading intellectual property and tech transfer organization. And its mission is to take the discoveries from academia and translate them out into the world to the benefit of society. And so over decades now, gift funding from WARF through their royalties gen and licensing fees generated from patents and their investment strategies have gener generated tremendous impact for the University of Wisconsin and the world beyond. So to honor Professor Steenbach, the Department of Biochemistry sponsors symposia in his name and, and the lectures that you're going to see here today and tomorrow. The, these lectures are also sponsored by Illumina, which many of you know is a world-leading uh, DNA sequencing and reagent company that has one of its critical facilities located here in Madison. Many of our graduates and colleagues then interact with alum, Illumina or become employees, or interns, as we might say. This, this symposium is also sponsored by the Global Health Institute, led by Professor Jorge Osario, here who is in the School of Veterinary Medicine. And so we're joined today by Professor Tulio de Oliveira. You can see his many, many leadership roles in science around the world. Uh, it's quite an impressive list. I'm not going to read it off to you. But I would like to let you know a few things about his academic history. He got a BS in, from the Federal University de Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil in 1997. And his PhD is in biomathematics, bioinformatics, and computational biology. Now, some of us who've lived in this academic space for a while know that was kind of a foundational time for those aspects of science to emerge. Okay? He was a po he, uh, that, and this work was done at the Nelson Mandela School of Medicine at the University of KwaZulu Zulu Natal. Got his PhD in 2003. He did post postdoctoral work at University of Oxford joined the South African National Bioinformatics Institute and University College of London then as a senior lecturer. And so from 2019, 2009 to 2017, he directed the genomics, genomics program of the Wellcome Trust. This is now known as the African Health Research Institute. And during that time, he also joined University of KwaZulu Natal as a professor of medicine he founded the Kwasa Zulu Natal Research Innovation and Sequencing Platform. And I kind of learned yesterday, this is like a very, very beautiful place to have come out and started an aspect of his career. Um, during that time, so what he was achieving is sequencing and traced dengue, Zika, HIV, TB, and SARS-CoV-2. All of you know what those are. These are worldwide scourges. He's now full professor of bioinformatics at Stellenbosch University 
which is a beautiful university in South Africa that has many, many structural and intellectual parallels with UW-Madison. Part of the reason we have Professor De Oliveira here and Jorge and I and Worf are working to understand if there are critical intellectual overlaps between our institutions that we can carry out science to benefit humanity. Dr. De Oliveira led the team during the COVID pandemic that identified the beta and the Omicron variants. And so in an evolutionary biology sense, this is right at the cutting edge of science understanding the impacts of potential epidemics or pandemics. He's published over 300 papers in, well, all the top journals, the best journals ever, right? He's won, won numerous, numerous prizes, 2021, 22, 23, 24. We're hoping that this streak will continue based on this outstanding progress and contribution. He has a compelling vision to advance a field of genomic surveillance to improve the health and well-being of people around the world. One health is sometimes boiled down to be a word that would be associated with Tulio's research. And in that context, he's trained over 2,000 people in Africa to bring up their scientific skills uh, to advance this mission. So it, in this context, it's my great honor to be able to provide this introduction. Scientific lecture today and his public lecture tomorrow, 5 p.m., provide an integrated look at the nexus between scientific expertise, pandemic assessment, climate change, and human behaviors. His insights are timely, far-reaching, and hopeful about paths forward, which is an important ending statement. So please join me in giving a resounding Madison welcome to Professor De Oliveira. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Go for it, man. No yeah. time traveling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I hope, can you hear me? Okay, fantastic, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that I ever got such a nice introduction, so thank you, Brian, <laughs> for that, yeah. What I thought is just to take you in a kind of a journey, yeah, a, li a little bit about what we did um, during the pandemic and how we pivot again in the last two years to use the same technology that, that, that we have used to deal with, with lots of other pathogens, yeah. So what I thought is just about, uh, just highlight like five main points that, that we have done. One is preparedness, yeah, and never uh, underestimate the, the role of being prepared to respond to something, yeah. And at the moment, the world is going in the opposite way, yeah. We, we, it's like we are, we are kind of ignoring epidemics and and we are forgetting to prepare. But if you can prepare, you can respond. A lot of time the response is not only the scientific response. You need communication, activism, you have to make sure that your, your, your results get to the right person that can get a decision, yeah. And then what we did is that during the process, yeah, it's not just about science, but it's also about training, and training people that can respond to the epidemic. And for us, this is more important than anything else and then in the end, scientific output. So, so, so last in, in our list, but as you're gonna see during that process, we still end up with, I think, like 20 or 30 science and nature papers, yeah? And that, and by inverting the game, by focusing on quick response, quick characterizations, yeah, you end up with the opposite, yeah? You end up like with this very high scientific output, even if it was not the priority. And then as the pandemic started, my whole group, they had enough of this virus COVID two years ago, and they decide to all pivot to, to again, to new pathogens, such as the one amplified by climate change, which we are trying to make a big program with Jorge Osorio, yeah, and human genomics, yeah. 
So just to start, just to take you in that journey, everything starts on Twitter, at least for us. Yeah. So this is, this is something that comes from the 31st of December and 1st of January. Yeah. We, I probably had better things to do in my life than be checking Twitter by the new year. But then we see two tweets of, of some uh, good friends and colleagues. Uh, one is Jeremy Farah. He was the previous uh, director of the Wellcome Trust and now the chief scientist, uh, uh, chief scientist of the WHO. And Andrew Roundboat that, that I was together in Oxford. And they talk about like about a new, <laughs> yeah, something happened in China, yeah. The new report suggests viral pneumonia, no human-to-human -human transmission, leakage to a fish market, patient men business owners, then must be repeated on nozzles, but from what? Case linkage to locations sound like Legionella, very different, but then why people is developing pneumonia? So that's that 1st of January, yeah. As by the 3rd of January, we, we, we're following that, and then, by a total of 44 patients uh, with unexplained diagnosis of viral pneumonia yeah, were found, yeah, and that was a release official uh, out, um, update in the Wuhan um, Municipal Health Commission. Yeah. And that, is, that continues as the main comment from the, from, from the scientific community. Yeah. On the 10th of January, yeah, another good friend and colleague, Edward Holmes, he's now at the University of Sydney. We were also together in Oxford before. He released the first genome. He made the genome public yeah, of a new pathogen that was quite close to, to SARS. Yeah, and that's where, by then, we start working. Yeah. So once we got the access to the first genome, what we did by the 22nd of February, we have produced a bioinformatic tool, a software application that could go for raw data and produce uh, uh, <laughs> genomes, assemble and classify the, the virus. We thought that was very important to have first the computational resource if we were to respond quite quick. Yeah. By that time, we start also procuring reagents. We have developed the sequencing method for, for COVID. Yeah. We, in the end, we work a lot with Illumina to come with, with, with the final method that's called covid sick, and then we start preparing, yeah. So just to take you in a short trip, yeah, from the 10th of January, uh, two weeks later, we have a software. We start ordering all the reagents, and we manage to get everything set up in South Africa before the first case emerged on the 5th of March. And that was really important because by then, all the we had no access to reagents. And we managed to get a good stock of, of reagents to be able to, to start to respond, yeah. And then I'm just gonna take you on two or three of the key things that, 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 that we did, yeah. For us, everything starts uh, on, on that. Our first big case is on the 4th of April, yeah, when the, the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee in South Africa, that would be the chief scientist of South Africa, yeah, f uh, phone us to try to help on an outbreak investigation in the hospital, yeah. Why he phone us? We have, I have a team of infectious disease specialists, and we have work in multiple hospital outbreaks. And for the people that work in hospital outbreaks, have anyone work in hospital outbreaks? Yeah, it's a very nervous thing. When you arrive, as many people die, yeah, and the healthcare uh, people are quite, traumatized, so a lot of that's not only the work, but also do that methodically and make sure that you can get all the data. So we get not only a call from that, but then we get a letter from the Minister of Health, yeah, a day later asking us to do all the, the understanding what's happening in that hospital. Why was so important that, yeah? Because in that hospital, we had 16 of the 18 cases in South Africa and for that, but when we become involved, yeah, the first thing that we did was early in the 16 case is try to understand how this pathogen emerged in the hospital and how it is spread, yeah. And just to understand quite quick, so what we do here is basic detective work, yeah. We just go and identify the, the patient, yeah. He is P1, a 38-year male, yeah, arriving in South Africa by plane on the 7th of, of March develop uh, uh, symptoms uh, on the 8th of March, present in the hospital by 9 in the emergency department, yeah, and then he's confirmed with a positive PCR. 
And then we have like three potential source of infections, yeah? This patient, this other one, and that. But then we start following patients that emerge, arrive in the hospital and move between the different wards, yeah? Which many of them die quite quick, especially the one with advanced uh, age. And we start falling to understand how the virus is spread in the hospital. So what did happen there? Yeah, so we had a, a patient, it was a, a, the, the man that he came back from Europe. Yeah, he emerged in the hospital, he'll go to a screening station, he go and sit in a triage area. Is that around like 1745, yeah? By a few, and he stayed there for a few hours. A, a couple of hours later, a patient arrived, had a cardio arrest, arrived in the hospital, is put in this, in, in this bed, yeah, and stay there until it's being, it's being, um, uh, until being, uh, <laughs> it starts being responsive and then it's transferred to the card cardiac ICU. And we have every reason to believe that was the time that the first transmission happened between this patient this, that come to the screening and the patient that start in, in this area, yeah. So this patient will then move first to another, um, to on the 13th of March, it moved to uh, a room, yeah, and then very quick we have one, two, three, four, five infections that happened that same ward, yeah. By that time, no one knew how the virus was transmitted, eh? So here it points to the first uh, ideas of either respiratory virus transmission, yeah, or to fomites or, or dirt medical material eh, between, between the people. So we have this first outbreak in this award, and that continues, yeah. This outbreak grow to be very, 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 very large, yeah. We involved almost every ward of the hospital, yeah. And by the date that we got involved with that, we had 119 infections. That was of 150 discovered in South Africa and 15 deaths, yeah. Very high case fatality rate with 80 of the 119 being medical staff. So just to show how the, the virus entered in a hospital and with, 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 with no uh, way to prevent infection, it is spread both in healthcare workers and then, and, and then patients, yeah. When we put all the information together, we have some very shocking things. So the, the, the virus emerging on the 9th of March, it starts with the first healthcare workers, yeah. That patient go back to a nursing home, the 81 years old, infecting the health home, go back to the hospital. You have an outbreak in the medical ICU. You have a second outbreak in the surgical ICU. You have a big outbreak in the dialysis unit. In this dialysis unit of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven infections, five die within 48 hours, yeah? And then it moved to the neurology wards, medical wards, and then, and then medical wards. So that outbreak really shocked South Africa. Was the first time we are not used with a highly transmitted uh, a, a virus that's transmitted by uh, respiratory. And then what we did is to generate a sequence in real time. We had a very clear hypothesis to test. Was that a one outbreak spread inside the hospital, as our, our, our suggest, or was multiple introductions from the community? Yeah. As you imagine, the hospital uh, management tried to say that's multiple introduction from the community. Yeah. And that, and that was quite important. So by then we generate uh, potentially what was like, that was all the genomes that exist on SARS-CoV-2, yeah? And South Africa had generated around 30% of the human genomes by that time. They were very close to the, the origin, yeah? They only had four mutations from the Wuhan sequence, yeah? And what we see is that was very clear. It's, the, it's a merge, it entered the patient tree, and then it's one outbreak that caused all the infections in the hospital. So the 17 of the 17 samples that we, we had to get genomes, all of them were almost identical and really suggesting one source of introduction and rapid spread in the hospital. But why is it important to understand that? Yeah. So what we decided to do, yeah, we decided to write a detailed report of, of that case. Yeah. And that was the report that guided most of the world on dividing the hospitals in green, yellow, and red areas, with patients not being able to move between a red area 
to an orange uh, area and neither from an orange to, to a green area, yeah? So that was published, we, that got downloaded hundreds of thousands of times, yeah, and then what we follow is with a very large training program in South Africa to over 10,000 medical staff, yeah. Really highlighting how not only to understand an outbreak, but how to prevent and how to avoid patients moving between wards, how to isolate medical works, how to put wards yeah, isolated. And in the end, it was very important because South Africa, in the end, ended up with much less uh, hospital outbreaks. Yeah. And that was a highlight uh, uh, early by science on, on how that, that, that report was so important to guide like, uh, policy around the world. Yeah. So by, by then, we, we, we had shown our government that was a direct request by the Minister of Health that, that was a use for genomic surveillance, and then we formed very early what was a, a network for genomic surveillance in South Africa. Yeah. I led that network, that time I was at CRISP at UKZN, and what we did is to set up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sequencing labs around the country, work in real time, and as you can see, most of them next to this green box. This is a national health laboratory service. That's a very big uh, lab from the government, allowing samples to move very quick to, to be sequenced in real time, yeah. South Africa ended up uh, setting up this, the, the second uh, global network. It, that was come like a few days after the UK, and that was very important and fully funded by our government, yeah. What we found, we found that in the first wave, yes, yeah, so just for example, just to ground you, here you have number of cases. Can you see this blip here? That was the hospital outbreak. Yes, yeah, so 90% of the cases in, in South Africa that time was in that hospital. Here is the genomes that we sequenced. We had the first wave, yeah, and then we calculate R0. We know that when higher than one is gonna grow or, and below one is gonna decrease. And what we found, we found that South Africa had hundreds, potentially thousands of introductions, and the great majority of them from Europe, yeah? So close to 90% of the introductions come from Europe. Why Europe? Around 80% uh, of our air traffic come to Europe, and they were having a large outbreak of COVID before. But once that was introduced, in the black ones here, they started having like localized epidemics, yeah? And by that time, we identified 16 different lineages of SARS-CoV-2 in South Africa. So some of the first lineages that have ever been described was in South Africa, and we work with the WHO to follow that classification, yeah. So what's happened? We have here the dates. Here is the percentage of genomes. Here in white is when I have hundreds of different lineages, not only from South Africa, but global. Here is three or four of the first of the 16 lineages, so no one tend to dominate until all change around October 2020, yeah, with one strain completely taking over and displacing all the other ones, yeah. Was the first time that we saw that, one strain completely replacing before the COVID pandemic was characterized by multiple lineages that could not compete each other, yeah. And that became known as the, as the beta variant, yeah. So that one, it had a lot of mutations where we didn't want mutations to happen. Yeah, this means in the, in the receptor binding domain, yeah, that, that increased transmissibility. And here in the non-terminal domain, that's the main area affected by antibodies, yeah. And that was a way to, to, to find that. Yeah. This mutation was very important because, to be honest, was when we present about this mutation on the World Health Organization, yeah, uh, Virus Evolution Working Group, that was the mutation that allowed the UK to identify what was the alpha variant, yeah. Why they call alpha and we call beta? We had agreement that we would make public the data in the same day, but they decided to make the public data one day early, yeah. <laughs> And that's, and that's because the alpha uh, outbreak was already rampant for three or four months in the UK before they detect the variant. And that was a way to they save face, yeah. Not a fault of the scientists, but that's when government and scientists get involved, yeah. But what's happened when we discover a variant in South Africa, what we did with the beta and multiple times, yeah. 
So normally, uh, it's my responsibility as head of the Network for Genomic Surveillance to inform the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, and then we follow with a call with the Minister of Health, yeah, and then I inform the WHO Virus Evolution Working Group. I am a, a member of this uh, working group, and the Africa CDC. If the, our minister find that's important, we request a presentation to the National Coronavirus Control Council that's chaired by our president with all the 28 ministers, and that following with a press briefing with the Minister of Health and the Director of Africa CDC in live TV, yeah. And normally what our president do, it take 48 hours, yeah, to pass a lot of legislation to increase the response level until, uh, until he come in the national TV. We did that multiple times in South Africa, in the first wave, in the beta, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm normally responsible to do the press briefing when I discover the beta, the delta, and the Omicron, yeah. So it's a process that worked quite well. In the end, you are going to highlight on the Omicron, we did all that in less than 48 hours, from early look until validation, communication, and become a variant of concern. But the most important thing when you identify a variant is not only communicate, is what would be the most important question, especially for Jorge, he works in vaccines, is to see if the vaccines, it is uh, available. So what we did with colleagues, uh, as soon as we identify each of the variants, we managed to move the, the, the virus very quick for a live virus assay that was done in our building. We could do that very rapidly. In 10 days from a discover of a variant, we had a full live virus assay that we could see the neutralization. And with another colleague at WITS on, the, on the, the pseudovirus assay. And then the first question that we have to ask was, does plasma collected from people after receipt of the CHADOX, the CHADOX was the Oxford AstraZeneca, was the only available vaccine in South Africa, neutralize the beta, that's before it became known as the beta, before they were used the mutations, yeah. So what we found is that uh, both in the pseudovirus and the live virus, most of that was strongly att attenuated, yeah. With 79% of the pseudovirus and around 60% of the, the, the live virus have completely no detectable neutralization at antibodies. And now we put the government in a very difficult position, yeah. What would you do if you, now you have one vaccine on, but then you have results that show that very strong attenuation, yeah? One thing that didn't help us in this, in this trial of the AstraZeneca is that when we unbundled the trial, yeah, we, had the, we didn't have any severe case. So what we had, we had a completely overlap between, between the vaccine and placebo. So here's the Kaplan-Meier trial, number of infections, yeah. And then what you do, you had the same number of infections in, in vaccine and placebo. At that time, we still expect the vaccine to prevent infection, which you know that this do not happen in COVID, yeah. So then what I did with another colleague of mine that, is the, that was the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, yeah is to try to put all the data together between all the approved vaccines, yeah, on both pseudovirus and live virus, most of them done in South Africa, or public data, and try to see what would be the neutralization decrease. So what we had that all the vaccines had a decrease in neutralization against the beta variant, not as extreme as the AstraZeneca, yeah, and then when we link that to clinical trials done in South Africa, we had multiple clinical trials in South Africa. That's the AstraZeneca. As I mentioned, we didn't have, uh, we have no more dear, uh, uh, severe or hospitalization case, so we didn't know what was the effect. But we had two other vaccines, the Johnson Johnson and the Pfizer, that they show very high efficacy, yeah. And that is in the end was the vaccines that was chosen by South Africa to, to be holden. So we present that information to the government and they decide to, to then use these two vaccines that was during the beta to, to, to do the vaccination in South Africa. We still believe that the AstraZeneca would be efficient, but we didn't have enough data on that. Yeah. And so just to ground you and almost finishing the COVID part, yeah. So here is, here is the hospital outbreak again. That's our first wave. We had 16 lineages. The second wave was quite extreme. We had the beta variant. The third wave, we had the delta, yeah. 
And then when we had enough of this virus, yeah, another one emerged very quick that grow very fast, yeah. By then, we were very used to do that kind of thing in real time, so just to understand how the, the discovery of Omicron happened. On the 15th of November, uh, alert is raised by one of the private labs. Yeah, what they see, they see one of the, the PCR uh, uh, probes failing, what we call the S gene uh, target failure. Yeah, normally the PCR has three probes, one fail. We know that in the pandemic, the variants, they, they, they move between fail and no fail. That's a deletion, 6970 amino acid position. So they highlight that. They send samples to us. We, that took a little bit of time. By the 22 of November, yeah, we had seven genomes, and they were highly mutated. What we did uh, by the 22 of uh, no, November, one genome was also producing in Botswana, seven in, in South Africa. But now we have to answer the question, is this really a variant, or is this just an outbreak? A hospital outbreak will look exactly like that. Everyone gets infected by the same. So what we did, uh, I call an urgent meeting, and then what we did is to move samples from around 100 uh, different clinics to my lab, and then to be sequenced in real time. And then we do that in a very fast sequencing method. We can receive the samples in the morning. In the afternoon, we have all the genomes analyzed. And by then, what we see is that every single genome of this, we got around 70 genomes of high quality of these 100 different clinics are all uh, uh, these, these new variants, really suggesting very fast spread, yeah. And here's the number of cases in South Africa, just starting, yeah. So one, one day, by that day, I have talked to the Minister of Health, yeah. The next day, we talk to the, to, to the president. The president do a press briefing in South Africa, making that public that we have a new variant. One day later, we call a special meeting of the World Health Organization, and the variant, it is recognized as a variant of concern. So since we have all the genomes that we are making sure that's a variant, yeah, until on the 23, in two days, it is making public by our president in live TV. One day later, a new variant, almost no case, but what it happened is start growing very fast around the world, yeah. And then again, we have to do a similar question. What would be the effect of the vaccine? That was a very uh, clever experiment that we did with Alex Sigal. Yeah, we have here people that have two doses of vaccinations. Yeah, that's from the, 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 that's the Pfizer vaccine, yeah. And we didn't have anyone boosted in South Africa. So we create a proxy for boosting. Someone with two vaccinations and one previous infection. Because we knew that they have higher level of antibodies. Yeah? And that what we saw with the Omicron, we would have a full decrease on the antibody. But people that had like two uh, vaccinations and one previous infection would still have very high vaccine efficiency. Yeah? And that was some of the results that really uh, uh, drive the whole globe on the booster vaccination. All that results were public since the discover of Omicron with all the viral neutralization in two weeks. Yeah. We could make the live outgrow neutralization analysis and publication of results. And then we, then we look at the other uh, arm with other colleagues at UCT of the immune system, the T cell uh, uh, response. And what we found is that we have a much lower decrease of, of, of T cell response. And that's one of the reasons why we think that Omicron was so much less little, yeah, because most of the, the globe would have a kind of immunity. Just to ground you here, we see this result very uh, on the spike-specific cells, percentage CD4. This is one dose of the Johnson & Johnson, two doses. This is two doses of the Pfizer and people with just previous infection. So what we see is that the majority, between 70 and 86% of the CD4 response is preserved. Really highlighting at that time of the pandemic, yeah, we would have still protection not only from antibodies from previous vaccinations, yeah, but especially from T cell uh, uh, response. Yeah. So after we we do that, we release data in real time within days. Yeah, we guide the the 
we help like to design the hospital uh, outbreak, uh, avoiding outbreak system, the efficiency of the vaccines, yeah. Do you think that the globe has been very kind with us in South Africa? Uh? No, so what they did, they straight away, both in the time, in the beta and in the Omicron, the first thing that they do is to put a travel ban to South Africa, yeah. And we highlighted very clear, we have no reason to believe that Omicron has emerged in South Africa. To be honest, we have very reason to believe that it has not emerged in South Africa. We just had a very efficient uh, genomic surveillance system, yeah? And then what's happened is that the, we have this extreme uh, uh, travel ban that was very damaging from South Africa. Before that, we had a 281 days travel ban because the beta to the UK, yeah? And then, despite in that, we highlight that the travel ban would be inefficient, would be unethical, yeah, and quite important, can really, can, can really open a dangerous scenario that countries do not report the news variant and pathogens, yeah. And did the Omicron came to, to the UK, to, to, to the USA? Uh? And did it cause a lot of infection? Uh? Another thing that I haven't shown you yet, the Omicron in South Africa, because we discovered so early with almost no infection, and we made public, and we had the, we prepare hospitals to respond, and we started boosting all our healthcare workers, we end up with almost no deaths of Omicron in South Africa. And in the US, did you end up with some deaths from Omicron? Eh? Just highlighting that if you respond quite quick, that's the way that we stop epidemics, yeah. But despite that, we persevere. We also identify the BA4 and BA5, yeah, which was, again, characterizing South Africa. That was the strain that caused most of the, what would be the winter infection in the US and Europe, yeah. Uh, no, the summer infection wave. And in the end, most of the vaccines, they were being designed either with BA4 and 5 or BA1 and 2. All the discoveries from South Africa, but again, with no benefit to the country, just the, the, the opposite, yeah. But it's not just a sad story, yeah, because one thing that we did from that is that, just to highlight, we have the Network for Genomic Surveillance, fully funded uh, by our government, yeah. Once we discover the first, uh, the, the first variant, our government released around $20 million of funding from a bigger network that had over 500 scientists. We raised over $400 million from outside grants to respond to that. In, and we, we coordinate a, a very detailed program between genomics, virology, immunology, clinical trials, and epidemiological modeling that could go very quick from discovery, live virus assay, clinical trial and then also allow us to put a very strong competition to win what's called the World Health Organization mRNA Hub program, yeah? Which is quite good because as you want or not that it is linked to Wisconsin, I don't know. Is Eric from WAF Foundation here? No? So, okay, we're gonna meet him. But WAF Foundation was one of the first investors in Afrigen. Yeah? And so, Yes. And arrived right before the pandemic. Okay. And her job was to set up their analytics. Okay. As that everything was set So this is all part of the origin of how we managed. Good. So that was quite good. That 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 was a relatively big award. That was around a hundred and fifty million dollars have entered the country for create the first mRNA hub program in the world as a training center. Yeah. I helped to coordinate that application. We do the genomic surveillance. I was talking to Jorge. You were in a meeting last week. Uh, they have a ring fence around $2 billion for this program to really try to move to the next level, the production of vaccine where it's needed, yeah. In our case, during the pandemic, I was not only busy by running a network, help to coordinate a lot of scientists, helping the country to put this application, but then I decided to also found another institute, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just because uh, one thing that we wanted that was in Durban, in very good facilities, 
but we wanted to really have a place that can attract great talent because in the end it's all about people, yeah? So what we did, we also raised quite a lot of money. We worked with our university and then we, we, we launched this, this building. Yeah, it's quite called the Biomedical Research Innovation. Yeah, it's quite a large building. This, uh, three floors in the front, in the back is five floors. Here in the 50th floor, we have 12 BSL-3 labs, yeah. And then in the ground floor, we have automated biorepository, and here is our lab, yeah. Really trying to get like very high level uh, facilities for respond to that, yeah. So it's a building that can take a thousand scientists, yeah. I know that you have many of those in here in, in Wisconsin, yeah, but that was one of the biggest investment in South Africa, Don. Everything funded by our own university, yeah. And then we, we so that's buildings between Stellenbosch and Cape Town, yeah, both Brian and Jorge and Eric came there, and then what we also did, yeah, we are very heavily data, so we also launched what we call the School for Data Science and Computational Thinking, yeah, and that it is to advance data analysis, AI, and, and modeling. Yeah, we are just finishing uh, the refurbishing of, of another building. Yeah, that's in the Stellenbosch campus. That's around 150 uh, data scientists, and we would be very good to see how to link to Wisconsin. Yeah, but then the thing that really excited Jorge was neither the two of this building, but is our third uh, building that we have in Stellenbosch, that stay inside a wine farm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> so, so that was a, a, a program that we did with uh, the Stellenbosch did with the Wallenberg and Nobel Foundation. Yeah, it's the biggest investment of the Wallenberg Foundation outside Scandinavia. Yeah, and then as part of that investment, Stellenbosch University bought a wine farm in the middle of the city, and then we put inside what we call the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Science. And then we have the, the wine cellar. It's one of our, our data group, yeah. And that's quite nice. They still make their own wine there. But it's such a nice place because here's what Stellenbosch look. Yeah? We, we have around 200 wineries around us, beautiful mountains, yeah. That uh, is a very good place. People like coming there. Who enjoy a lot was the Nobel's uh, Foundation. So what they decided, they decided that now Half of the Nobel symposiums, yeah, are to be run in South Africa, yeah. So we ran, we ran last year, and I participated in the physics. Was on AI, it was very interesting, yeah. And then they had the the chemist who was on on tuberculosis, yeah. Then they just have the medicine that was in cardiovascular um, uh, disease, and then they're gonna have now the peace and the economics, yeah. So we agree with first with three, but they already add another two. So what we're gonna have, we're gonna have 10 Nobel symposiums happening in South Africa in the next four years, yeah. And the Nobel Foundation say, why are you still doing Scandinavia? Because it's much nicer to do that, yeah. <laughs> and I hope I can, I can convince you to come visit because that's one of the ideas, yeah. So in addition to that, what we, we did, we thought that was our moral compass to not only help South Africa, but to help the rest of Africa with the Africa CDC and the World Health Organization, yeah, we create a structure of laboratories that we call the African Pathogen Genomic Initiatives. And we set up a sequencing labs with the Africa CDC and the WHO in every country in Africa. And then you have what you call a national sequence lab, you have a regional sequence lab, that's some of the big ones that support the regions, yeah. And then you have the specialized genomics facilities, yeah. This one's just by informatics, so you have three specialized genomics, yeah. And we are one of the three that with a mandate to respond to help every member state or each of the 54 African counts to, with sequencing. So we have done sequence during the pandemic for 24 African countries, yeah. And, and, and train many of them, but they're gonna give information on that. And that was quite a, a nice time because uh, the whole world was busy and traditionally you have all this collaboration of some African partners with Northern partners, but everyone was busy responding to the pandemic. And we have the chance for the first time to create these this, this programs within Africa. So we published um, 
two papers, uh, both, both, both of them on science. That's the head of my bioinformatics group, the head of my data science. The first one have 138 uh, collaborators from Africa, and the second one has 318 collaborators, yeah. For the first time, we could put a big network to not only generate data, but to analyze data together, yeah. And then what we thought that as part of that, we try to do what we call holistic collaboration. We share all the protocols, the data sets, and the analysis uh, scripts. And then we follow that with a large training program, yeah. In this end, this training program go to be quite big, yeah. So for that, we, we needed a, a, a basket of funders because it was too big for one funder, yeah. In our facilities, we end up hosting 510 fellows from 48 African countries, yeah. And they come from a mix of short-term fellowships when they come from very uh, specialized data analysis to middle-term fellowships, yeah, to long-term fellowships, yeah. And that was very exciting. To be honest, that was what my lab and the data science group liked the most, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Yeah. Because they were so bored of doing the same thing at every day, yeah. Yeah, imagine, and, and what you have to understand, our labs are not really academic lab. My lab is an ISO accredited lab, yeah. And people get so bored, I was talking to Brian about that. Yeah? So they have to follow protocols, and, and then when we stop the lab for a few days to host a lot of fellows, oh, that was the happiness, yeah. <laughs> so not only was, was was good for giving back, but was also good to our own people, and they felt very motivated by this program, yeah. And at the moment, we are discussing with the MasterCard Foundation and also with Vince Wisconsin to, to grow that to the next level, that we would take middle and long-term fellowships and with a link to also innovation and industry, yeah. So we are discussing with them quite a big program from that. In addition to that, we, now we have a, a growing program of AI, yeah that I discussed with the aims that we are getting multiple AI fellows to come, and we also want to see how to exchange them, yeah. So now we have all these fellows in 48 countries, yeah, in Africa that we have well trained. So what we decided, we decided to launch another program. And now, and what is a program? Because we thought that would, we need to keep people busy, otherwise you set up these 40 sequencing labs in Africa, what will happen with them in two years? Eh? They will be absolute dead, and we will end up what's happening in Africa multiple times. You set up great ma machines, yeah, but then they go stop being used for lack of resource, yeah. So we, we launch a program that call, uh, that with the train of the fellows that we pivot from COVID to respond to climate amplified disease. So in addition to genomic data, we put a lot of big data analysis yeah, together to really try to respond uh, to that. And then, so what's the vision of this program, Climate? Yeah, it's a global consortium yeah, to generate knowledge, develop tools and interventions to predict, track, and control disease and epidemics amplified by climate change. Yeah and then to use this advance to prevent the global spread of epidemics and pandemics. Because we know that as we want or not, this virus, they keep moving, yeah? So why we try to, to put everything under a climate change umbrella, yeah? Because it's much easier to discuss with funders and government. They, they have very short attention span. That's, I learned that from, yeah, I don't know if you guys found the same, eh? Uh? Yeah, and then, and then if you talk about dengue, chikungunya, yellow fever, uh, listeria, they, and then at least if you can put them an umbrella, and that was a beautiful uh, review, this, this is not our paper, yeah, that showed that around 58%, around 60% of the, of the pathogens in the world will be amplified by different climate hazards, yeah, with the bulk of them being virus, most of them transmitted by vector-borne, some waterborne and airborne, but also bacteria. So by putting that under that, we can model the climate, we can analyze the climate, but then we can respond to that, yeah. So we had a lot of, uh, and then what we try to do is to work in three areas, ecology, epidemiology, and evolution, yeah, to try to understand 
how the epidemics happen, but also how the pathogens evolve, yeah. And then we had a hell lot of fun with the fellows. What we do with these fellows, yeah, that's the countries that we have trained people. If they see an outbreak, they can request reagents and we will ship them reagents. Or, if, or, or they can ship us the sample, whatever is more efficient. They much prefer when we ship them reagents so they can do that. So we create quite an efficient way because we had worked with a company that, that moved uh, samples for us in Africa and they can move reagents. And what we have done in the last year we have, we have done like, I think that we are in number 15 of those that they identify a pathogen and then we help them to respond. I'm just gonna give you three examples because I don't wanna bother you too much. But for example, they, they had a big flood, a big flood and, and what happened, that's Malawi, a photo of Malawi, yeah. And we know that extreme events, floods can really uh, spread a lot of bacteria, yeah such as cholera, E. coli, leptospirosis, yeah. And then what they did, so here is in Malawi, they had some outbreaks of cholera during the last two decades. Here is the year, the case, the deaths, and the case fatality ratio. And then uh, 2022 to until now, they had the biggest outbreak, which we think that's just the tip of iceberg. They have much more cases with a high number of deaths and a very high case fatality ratio, yeah. And what you have to understand about cholera in a very poor country is not only the number of people that die, yeah, which is it's still terrible, that completely destroy our health system. Now you have clinics that are red flooded, that, 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 that do not like, and then now you have a cholera outbreak that you have to isolate the clinic and it's really, really terrible. When we talk to the doctors without board during that outbreak, some of the most senior people, they come in the call and they start crying. And these are people that are used, that's the ones that go to Palestine, they were no mad ones, the MSF, they go anywhere that no one went to go, yeah? And that outbreak was really, really extreme, yeah. What we found, yeah. We found that first thing, this, this in the end is quite predictable and that's what we want to highlight. Just to ground you, this, since 1960, you had multiple outbreaks in Africa, yeah. So we could identify 13 large outbreaks, yeah, which then they get a number in the classification, T1 to T13, yeah. And always an outbreak in Africa, it come from outbreak in Asia. Africa, Asia, Africa, Asia, Africa, Asia, Africa, Asia. Always, every single time. And not only that, but what we could see that this kind of outbreak in, in Malawi, we could time, was a date of 13th of July of 2022, with associated with a very large outbreak that seemed to have started in Bangladesh, potentially, yeah, moved to, to, um, to India, yeah, but then caused a very large outbreak in Pakistan that was during the extreme floods in Pakistan. I don't know if you remember that end of 2020, uh, in 2022, and then moved to Malawi and, and caused that outbreak. Very clear association. But then when we put a whole lot of, of big data together and hear what we did here in these green buttons, yeah, it's from satellite data that we calculate the number of flooded uh, areas in Malawi. Yeah, what we, what we come, we come very simple, yeah. Malawi had multiple cyclones in 2022, but by then no cholera cases. So you had the, the Pakistan flood, we could time that's when the strain emerged that went to Malawi, was introduced in Malawi in the dry season, yeah. So what it means, very small number of cases, a new lineage, then when start floods and cyclones is exploding in the worst cholera uh, outbreak ever. Really highlighting for public health that if you detect a completely new strain that the population do not have immunity, yeah, in case in Africa is likely to arrive in the dry season, that's the time that you could prepare to respond with all the vaccination and, and, and hydration tents. Yeah? And that was, was quite important uh, to understand that. All the sequences have been done in Malawi, first time ever. Yeah. They had a sequencer, we sent the, the reagents, we used the same process that we sequenced TB, 
and then we could generate, analyze, and report that in real time with, within weeks of this outbreak being happening. Yeah. So that's one that we, we, we do. We also have done cholera in, in the DRC and Cameroon. Another one that we are very worried at the moment, and I know that, that, that Jorge is also worried, is about Rift Valley Fever. That is a, a, a virus that normally live in the environment and the normal rains, uh, normal rains have low episodic potential. If you have heavy rains and floodings, it tends to move from the environment to mosquitoes, yeah, and then start the first livestock cases, yeah, and then start being transmitted by humans, normally by working with livestock, and then it can enter an uh, epidemic, uh, uh, epidemic phase through mosquitoes. Rift Valley is one of the viruses that have pandemic potential. And the case fatality rate is very high, yeah. So what we did, we worked with colleagues in, in Kenya, yeah, to first uh, generate a method to sequence that efficiently, yeah, but also in the same way as we do, did with COVID with a software application that could do the analysis in real time, yeah. So what we, what we discover? We discover that in Africa, we are busy sequencing now uh, thousands of genomes, but it was a very small number of genomes, yeah, with here in the countries, yeah, but a lot of diversity. So we had to work together with the community to identify a lineage systems, HOO, and what we have, we have like three main lineages that seem to, to potentially worry for causing outbreak. The main one, lineage C, yeah, which is being spreading, for example, in uh, Egypt, Kenya, yeah, Uganda, a case in South Africa, Mauritania, yeah, lineage H and lineage K. But quite a lot of diversity. So which one do you feed for vaccine design? Which one? Uh, and that's what we are working, is to working with that and collaborators. Now we have the sequence system. The, the automated analysis to do that. So what we did is to follow all the, the, the parameters that understand for the transmission of that. That's where a lot of AI and data science coming to understand like what would cause uh, the environmental variables from the outbreaks. It seems that always started in, in, in around Zimbabwe, not Zimbabwe, moved to Kenya, big amplification, Rwanda, Burundi, that's where a lot of samples have potentially all genotype C, but potentially high diversity, yeah. And then to access now with the methods through the climate network, we are busy uh, sequence uh, hundreds, if not thousands of samples. And all these protocols, they are available. And anyone in Africa that wants access to them, we're gonna give, and if they need reagents, we will ship to them. And the, why we want to do that? Because that's the big objective of the mRNA hub in South Africa. So one of the big objectives is to try to develop a Rift Valley mRNA vaccine. So once we describe the genomic diversity, <coughs> we inform them. So that can be selected for mRNA vaccines, yeah. So just two last quick examples, otherwise they're gonna bore you too. Yeah, but it's about dengue. Dengue, it's a, a very big, um, it's, it's really caused global havoc. What's happening? Uh, South America this year was out of this world, not uh, in Argentina, they have had a hundred fold increase of case. We identified two large outbreaks uh, in 2023, and, and they still continues in Ethiopia and, um, and Burkina Faso. What we work with, we had fellows in both of the place, so we managed to get samples or ship reagents and to construct to that. So what we think is that we have a unique opportunity to expand genomic surveillance because that, for example, uh, during the SARS-CoV-2, that's where we, we put sequences from with the Africa CDC. So now we have sequences in almost every African country, so yeah, and now, if we can support them with protocols and reagents, yeah, they can continue responding to that, yeah. So that's what we did. This one's quite an interesting case that's in Ethiopia. Just to ground you, it was end of last year. That's the epidemiological curve, first suspected case, and went quite, quite big, like 25,000 cases per epidemiological week detected, yeah. And in two different regions, Afar and Diridawa, yeah, 
which, which regions of, of, of high um, transmission potential that come from big data analysis that, that we do, but start to move into the low, to, to the highlands, that's what worry us, yeah. What we found there, yeah, we found that, we found that this large outbreak in Ethiopia had three sources. Very, very surprising. We thought that they all the same genotype, then three genotype three, and major lineage B. Yeah, we, we also, with colleagues in EA, we just launched a new classification for dengue in a few weeks ago. But then the bulk of the cases, yeah, with one common origin, yeah, and where that, yeah, it seems to be basal to Italy, with the potential of Italy introducing the strain to Ethiopia. We cannot solve the directionality at the end, but the phylogenetic put with the Italians as samples very basal. That would be quite ironic. Imagine if an outbreak in Italy could feed the outbreak in Africa. Yeah, quite likely. But within the climate, we are also the ones that, the consortium that responded to last year, the large outbreak in, in Italy. Just to ground you, here is data from Italy. That's 2023. Yeah, normally Italy do have like a number of cases, most of them imported, yeah, within the summer with a little bit of localized transmission, but last year much higher than normal. Okay, it happened mostly, it happened in the three different regions with the bulk of the infection in Lombardia, here close to Milan, yeah. And can you see the peak of the Italian outbreak starting in June and in July, and the peak of the, uh, and that's just before the, the start of the outbreak. In, <laughs> we don't know if it, if it was an Ethiopian traveler in Italy that by chance they sequence or not, but Italy only had nine genomes, yeah. We produce as 50 or 60 from, from Ethiopia, so again, but, but really showing very strong relationship and potentially a, which we couldn't reject that that came from Italian uh, introduction to, to, to Ethiopia. Another big source of, of infection, and that normally it's come from India. We have reason to believe that may sometime have an intermediate step to the, um, to the Middle East, yeah, that also cause uh, that, that outbreak. So now we have in Ethiopia in one year, biggest outbreak, three introductions, yeah, potentially one from Europe, one from Asia, yeah, just highlighting the dynamic, uh, yeah, thing, yeah. And so what our, our team like uh, doing, yeah, we, we are mostly data scientists. To be honest, 80% of my team is data scientists. Yeah, we, we run big genomics facility, but that's what we do. Yeah, we start experimenting a lot with uh, epidemiological uh, eco modeling, ecology, and AI. Yeah, and here what we did is to, to link a lot of data yeah, that, that M mosquito prevalence, yeah, 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 altitude, yeah, yeah, number of flooded areas, yeah, temperature, yeah, mobility together to calculate the first disease tra transmission suitability in the continent, yeah, and then from flight data from across the world, the chance of being introduced. Yeah. So what we find is very interesting. We find that in East Africa, there is a high risk of importation from Asia. West Africa, large risk, risk importation from South America. And some countries with high risk of importation like South Africa, we have no uh, transmission potential. Yeah, despite most of the traveling, for example, from Brazil go via South Africa, and that's where you have some of the biggest outbreak, we have a reason to believe that we're not gonna have because we almost don't have disease potential. Just to try to understand and predict in a similar way when you have a, a large outbreak, where is likely to emerge and when, yeah? And we do that with a, with a lot of um, mathematical epidemiology and, and now AI, yeah. Last virus to present to you is chikungunya. Chikungunya is one that, that do worry us quite a lot, yeah. Uh, how many of you have heard of chikungunya? Okay, okay, many of you. One of the things, so it's a virus that has been originated, it was first identified in Tanzania in 1952. In, in 2005, it seems that the strain got some mutation and started uh, moving across Asia, 
yeah, yeah, Micronesia. It is being introduced in 2013 from in the Caribbean and 2014 direct introduction from Angola to Brazil, and then found the perfect environment there. Yeah, massive outbreaks, yeah. One of the things why worry us of chikungunya is again, is not just the, the, the mortality, but the long time uh, effect, yeah. So it's, many of you are gonna be aware that some people get chikungunya and they can never, they have such uh, sores in the joints that they can never go back to manual labor, yeah. Imagine what's the effect in a poor family if you lose one of the main breadwinners, yeah. So what we did here is one, one that we respond very quick in, in, in Paraguay, yeah, from the climate program, yeah. That was quite interesting because all the, that's the genomic data is here. By that date, the paper is published, yeah. So we are talking about days after genomes of things. What you had in Paraguay, you had a gradual increase of temperature with last year with the highest uh, high temperature ever. I think that's getting common around the world, yeah. Paraguay, we had an outbreak in 2022, which we have to sequence, yeah, with the climate program, yeah. And then what happened December 2022 explode with very high number of cases, but very high number of deaths. Very surprising because we don't see a lot of deaths, yeah. What we found, our hypothesis, is that that was a strain from Brazil that entered Paraguay. We were wrong, yeah. That was a strain from Paraguay of the 2022 epidemic, yeah, that have caused an outbreak, mostly in outpatients, yeah. May have developed some mutations. We don't know if that's what happened or it's just uh, the ec ecological. You start getting large outbreaks with large number of people that die or neurological cases and a lot of neonatal cases just highlighting mother-to-child transmission, yeah. And that's quite good because we got access to all the samples, so we had a good phenotype. We could uh, un understand the clustering of that. We are not sure if it's a mutation or ecological environmental factor, but we know that um, uh, arriving in Asuncion and start moving to all the main high-density urban setting, yeah. Just to highlight that when entering a country, it, people would expect to go to the rural settings, not because Egypti, it is an urban mosquito, yeah. As we finish that, the same happened in, in, in Senegal. We had one uh, fellow, Abdul Padan, that a big outbreak happened in this area in, 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 in Ketagu. We ship reagents, he could sequence that within days was very interesting because we didn't expect an outbreak in, in, in Ketagu. Here is the, the, the forest uh, uh, coverage in, in, in Senegal. So in Senegal, chikungunya live in what you call the sylvetic cycle. This means not human to human transmission, but that use mosquitoes yeah, and, and, and small animals to, to kind of increase the viral load. Yeah. But high temperatures, when the temperature increase, look where it increased the most. Yeah in Katago, so now we think that we had a very high uh, disease susceptibility. High increase, even not a big forest area, big outbreak is start spreading around. We have reasons to believe that this is a, a basic, a completely new clade, yeah, completely different, and that, that left the sylvetic cycle, and now is human to human transmission. Also quite, quite important formation because that's what you call the West African clade. And at the moment, all the vaccines for chikungunya is using the other clade, the, the ECSA, yeah. Because until that, we didn't expect to leave the sylvetic cycle. Just highlighting that we have reasons to believe that climate change yeah, is beginning to make susceptible regions that were not susceptible before. Then just to finish, one of our big job is to engage with not only scientists, but with policy makers, yeah. So we, we engage very high with the Africa CDC, the WHO. I sit in the, for example, this is the lounge of the International Pathogen Genomics Surveillance Program of the WHO. I am in the board of that meeting, yeah. And in a way that the results can be transferred in real time. We find that public communication of science to, 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 to action is more important than papers, yeah. And it's quite funny because 
if the results get an impact, then the journals start chasing you for the papers, yeah? Because that, that's what we do. So everything that we produce, the data is available within the same day, public available. We communicate to the government, and only that we go to write the paper. But that's just in the epidemic uh, response, because we find that epidemic response is very important, yeah. We had a whole team in the last week here in the U.S., to really try to engage more with, with American scientists, yeah? And I hope that's a great engagement that we can, uh, we participate in five different conferences and events. I call that one of them. And that's a way that we can really engage, yeah, and try to ident to grow this program to other collaborators yeah, uh, around, yeah? And one thing that we did with the WHO is called a call for action, yeah? So to report how to break uh, timelessly, strand genomic surveillance, prioritize vulnerable populations, yeah? Promote climate resilience and commit to sustainable funding, yeah? The, the fellowship program alone that I mentioned to you, it cost us over $20 million, yeah? So it's not a cheap program, but we find that's really important to have these people well-trained in the different countries, otherwise, you're not gonna be able to respond to outbreaks and that can, can do that, yeah. Yeah, so that's just to conclude, yes. Yeah, so, so once the COVID finished, my team had enough of COVID, they all decided, they, they come to me and like 20 of them come to me and meet and say, we're not gonna touch a COVID data ever in our life. And then I say, okay, but then we create a new program called Climate, yeah which start a lot in Africa and Latin America. It's aimed to be a holistic consortium that involves capacity building, quick response to genomic surveillance and public health guidance, yeah. We, we start with widely uh, engagement with, but both not only partners, but also public health and political level, yeah. And now we have this fast response support to multiple countries. And we are also engaged a lot with climate scientists, yeah. So we participated in the COP last year on the first health day. We are going again, just because very important this transdisciplinary research, yeah. So thank you, just to thank the, some of the funders, yeah. We, we really need a basket of funders, yeah. And, and a lot of our funding comes from America, which we are very grateful, yeah. And we hope that together we can work uh, also to raise more funding and make that program successful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a couple minutes for some questions if anyone in the audience would like to ask something. Please don't be shy. Yeah, please don't be shy because we, we have a seminar series that we have an international presenter every year, every month, but normally we grill the presenter with like 20 minutes of questions after, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is uh, incredibly impressive and, and inspiring. I was just curious, when you talk about sending reagents around and things like that, I guess right now with... You can, you can do that and there's like maybe not too much of a shortage or demand, but I mean, what, do you have plans for if something hits so hard that you're, uh, you, you have a shortage or difficulties about how you're going to distribute it, like uh, w what the planning is there, or is there like a data science -y component to that as well, or yes. how, where, where does that sit? Yes, so the, the, of course we, 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 we live of, 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 of funding, yeah. So at the moment we have we have funding from the World the World Bank, the Rockefeller, some of the NIH, and a little bit from Abbott to do that program, yeah, to send reagents around. We probably still have another two years of funding from that, but we are busy uh, engaging with the next the next funders. Yeah, that was something that was really surprising for us because. Um, the first thing, how easy it was to move samples within Africa to our lab, yeah? Because we, the first thing, like, we didn't realize, but, like, for example, South Africa is the main pathology testing lab for the rest of Africa. So that when you present in a hospital or clinic in most of Africa, they will do, like, a, a number of tests in the clinic there and most of the complex they will send to South Africa. So South Africa has the biggest sample movement company in the world, it's called BioCare, was founded in South Africa, yeah? 
and and then and then the first thing. So what we did when we were receiving a sample for dozens of African countries, we decided to contract the company that all the pathology labs work with, yeah, and they can move samples within days anywhere in the country. And then we ask them, can you move the reagents back to us? And they and they come to us. Who do you think that send all the tubes to collect? the samples, <laughs> and I say, you guys, yes, we, we don't want to go, like, just go one way, and then it was, was surprisingly easy, because very well development um, network, yeah, of, of sample movement and reagents in Africa, potentially much easier than, than move samples here, I don't know what you'll find, or, yeah, so that's one thing, so we needed that, so, so we have that, we, we work very close with this company, of course, it's quite a lot of process because we have to assess the lab and a lot of time we have to take to make sure that we, s we send the whole package yeah to they do that so that's one thing yeah your second question about the data science it's not a problem at the moment but we expect to become a problem because um, the, the program is getting quite quite popular with Africa uh, partners, yeah, and and they are requesting more and more, yeah, yeah. So 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 it may become a problem, and that's why we keep we need to keep raising a large yeah funding, yeah. But one thing that we are very keen to do, and that's what the data science uh, do, is starting uh, have very clear ways to to guide where to sample, yeah. So to to make sure that we have all these fellows and that start putting like red lights. You are very likely to see an outbreak in your country of that in the next few months. Why? Because we see signal of the data, you see an outbreak in another country that normally introduced to yours. So that's what we are trying to do a lot with data science and AI, to be able to be more predictable and less uh, responsive. Yeah. Very, very impressive, and it's just kind of mind blowing. However, Africa is only one part of the globe. Yes. <laughs> you know, so you've expanded from South Africa with many sites in South Africa to like all of Africa, which is amazing. But there are clearly viruses coming from, as you've said, Brazil and from India and from Pakistan and I'm sure China. Are there similar organizations being put? together in each of these countries, and are you talking to each other? Yes, yes, there, there are, there are. So, so for example, um, to be honest, I concentrate a lot on the African uh, results here. Well, of course you should, you can't do everything. But yes. I'm curious if there are, do you have counterparts, or you, you, you're very inspiring, you must have inspired counterparts. Around yes, the yes. But for example, in, in Brazil, we, I work very close with the Fio Cruz Foundation. So that's the one that respond, that we help to respond to the Paraguay outbreak, yeah. To be honest, we have much more examples in Latin America than Africa at the moment, yeah. With, um, with Asia, we are working with two networks that we have, yeah. We are part of what's called the CREED network, that's this big PO1 program of the NIH. So, we have some good partners in, in, in Pakistan that we work quite a lot, and, and, and in India and in Thailand, yeah. And our idea of the climate program, yeah, is, is one that can link them, yeah, because, because what, what's the main, what one needs to do to be part of this program is just respond to three main uh, things, yeah. Make data straight available, so you don't hold the data, yeah and make sure that, uh, that that come in a holistic training program, that your objective is not just to get a sample and a data, yeah, and that the results go back to public health, yeah. So for example, we, we think that's a lot of uh, work to scope to work in the US and potentially even this region, for example, with West Nile, it's a virus that can affect you, yeah. And and with 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 Europe, I work. That's that's where I took that position, the Sanger Institute, because they run the big genomics. So, we want to grow this program as a as a global program, 
but then to link to other networks, such as the NIH, CREED, the Abbott Pandemic Defense Coalition, or, or a network that, that Jorge has on the Global Health Institutes, yeah. Okay, so, so it's quite simple to answer because the main reason why the program in South Africa was very successful is because when the, the government came and when we detect the first variant, they, they come to me and say, I want to give you a $20 million block grant, yeah, to me, and, they, and then I say, no, I don't want, I told them. What about you fund direct the people, yeah? And the effect that that had was was very large because now everyone is on network, but they are getting the grant direct from the government, and that's what. And then from this twenty million dollars, we could raise another four hundred million dollars from yeah. And that's the same program that to do. We have no intention to centralize funding. Yeah. So one big program that we're doing with that fellows. Yeah, is that something that I'm talking with Vince Consen also. It is true with the MasterCard Foundation is to train them now on grant writing, on, on financial management, on grant management, in a way that they can be part of the program if they want or not, but that they start raising funding. Yeah. So yes, you would say that we would be competing with each other, but I don't know if you're competing with each other because I think that the, the amount of resources coming to Africa is, is very small, and a lot because there is not the capacity to raise funding, yeah, so. And if you train that, I think that we're gonna get more. Of course, South Africa is the, I don't know if you are aware, but uh, South Africa is the biggest country outside the US that get NIH money. Are you aware of that? Because we have infrastructure, and another thing it helped that we speak English, yeah. and. Uh, it helps, no? Because <laughs> one thing is true, yeah, and yeah. I hope I answer your question. Yes. So I want to come back to your the RNA program and building on your success in terms of identifying the um, strains of, the, of COVID and also the immunological responses. Yes. Um, when you're thinking, of, when you're starting to design and think about um, rapid vaccine development, are you, how, are you, how are you sort of thinking about that templating and also rapid information along the lines of what you've obtained for COVID? Yes, yes. So for example, yeah. So in this building, that, that, that both building, one in, in Durban and the other one in, in Stellenbosch, we have, we have close to a thousand scientists in the building, yeah. And we, we, we have a very advanced immunology department and a lot of BSL-3, yeah. My main job when we find, like, when we get, we detect, for example, we're now doing live outgrow of dengue. We managed to, to grow chikungunya on, on knee samples, yeah. So when we find a new, new variant, a new strain, yeah, a lot of my work is to phone my colleague and say, like, come collect the sample now, yeah. And he will come, we have some of the best uh, virologists in the world, they would come collect samples within minutes, yeah and then they will start the, the virus outgrow. So, and then we work with the immunologists yeah, to do all the experiments. So a lot of our work is mostly like collaborative and try to break in the silos and yeah. And what we found with COVID, but we also begin to find with the other pathogens, yeah. A lot of time, if you do that well and quick and fast, that, that increase a lot the the impact of the results, but that's where the, the companies start being interested, yeah. Because what they are interested in is, is 
getting access as early as possible to different strains, yeah, and have a place that they can, if they do, for example, you have a plasma that of someone that was vaccinated, they can send and we can see if that it will neutralize that, that, that virus quicker. So that's what we are trying to work with the mRNA hub. But, but we are still quite amateurs there. So that's one of the reasons why we've, we found that this collaboration with UW is quite important, yeah, because you have a lot of that knowledge uh, here. Yeah. Uh, I have a question on the methods for determining uh, the clusters of sequences in uh, the hierarchical, hierarchical clustering uh, you have for, uh, say, the cholera. So you were able to show that uh, the, um, the cases from Pakistan were somehow linked to those from Malawi yes. without having, I guess, a smoking gun of a few cases where they were both in Pakistan and Malawi. How are you cutting off that tree and... and uh, defining which cases are part of uh, different clusters? Yes, yes, that, that, that's an interesting question. So two things, yeah. One of that, that same lineage, yeah. one of, of, of the person that's part of the Climate Network, that's a founder with me, it is um, yeah, Ed Holmes in Australia. So that same lineage that we found in Malawi, three isolates were sequencing in Australia of Pakistan travelers. Okay, but the outbreak in Pakistan was very large. Yeah, you didn't even need that, but that's a direct thing. Yeah, another thing that we didn't realize, yeah, is that the association that Pakistan has to Malawi. Yeah, yeah, Pakistan is the country outside Africa that have the highest number of travelers to Malawi. And then when you talk to the people from Malawi, they say, yes, of course, they run most of the commerce here, yeah. Uh, and then at least it's that strong association. Unfortunately, it's common. <coughs> 13 of the 13 outbreaks of cholera in Africa come from either uh, India, Bangladesh, or Pakistan. And one thing that, and one thing that we are carefully, when we report to the Malawian um, Minister of Health, is also send the same message to the... Pakistani uh, embassy in Malawi and in South Africa to just go and say, look, this is no blaming on you, yeah? This is the opposite. The only thing that we can say is that, is to acknowledge that, that you release this genome public so we can see the linkage and we can prevent uh, another in infection, yeah. And that's where working also with the communication and the political uh, engagement, yeah. And that's what we have to do in the world. We have to stop blaming countries for identifying outbreaks, we should be... No, we should be supporting them financially, yeah, scientifically, because that's what we need, yeah? Yeah. yeah thank you. Hey, look, so in, in some ways, some of you have seen the future. And, you know, it could be a scary thing, but it could also be a really good thing. If you're still interested in this, be sure and contact me. This is not the end of this discussion by any means. Contact Jorge, contact me, contact Eric Iverson if you like. Contact Rich Gordon when he comes back here in September. Some of you have already met him. We're beginning to move forward on the next steps of looking for these kind of partnerships where People like you who've seen something might want to get engaged. So thank you so much for coming today. We'll be back tomorrow, 5 o'clock, for a, another talk, a, a public-oriented talk. Invite your friends who are not scientists to come to this. Increase the awareness. And then, yeah, there's free food afterwards. We want you to come and <laughs> eat it all, have a good time. So thank you so much. Thank you.